this time to start our Bible study. <coughs> and um, if you'll get your book and turn to page 623, we'll sing the first and last verse. And please sing out so I won't be heard. Six twenty three. opportunity to come to hear another lessons of the Bible. We ask you to be with those who could not be here with us today physically. We pray for those that, that decided spiritually not to come and we pray for their souls. Go with us as we listen and um, that we take what we learn to heart. And thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. You better pray real hard to get up. Cheryl comes. <laughs> Amen on that one. Well, it's uh, good to see all you folks again. Uh, good, to see you. Mm -hmm. good to see you. Good to be here. Well, I think the last time I was here that I taught the class, uh, I, was, I began a study of Romans didn't get into the uh, book of Romans, but uh, I gave some background information about uh, Romans, why it was written, who wrote it, and some things about Rome. This morning, as I continue in that line, I want to actually get into some teaching uh, from the book of Romans. So we're going to Starting in Romans chapter 1 this morning, and we're going to look at the first seven verses in, uh, in Romans chapter 1. So if you turn with me there, we will uh, we'll read first uh, verses 1 through 7. It says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he 
promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scripture concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also, uh, you are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First thing I want to point out as we get into this study this morning is that when Paul said that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God, he didn't mean that the resurrection made him the Son of God. Jesus has always been divine. Even before the beginning of time, uh, even during the creation of all things, Jesus was God. Rather, the resurrection was God's continuing declaration that this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. We find God reaffirming that over and over in the scriptures. Now, Jesus' baptism, for example, is recorded in uh, Matthew 3, verse 17. When he and John came up out of the water, the voice of of God said that Jesus was his beloved son. Then at his transfiguration, uh, as recorded in Mark chapter 9, verse 2, when Peter had insisted that they build two other tabernacles, one to Moses and one to Elijah, God reminded everyone that Jesus was his son, and everyone should just hear him. While the cross was the world's way of saying that Jesus was not the Son of God, the resurrection was God's way of declaring, yes, he is. Another fact that Paul stated here was that by the resurrection, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power. Now, the Romans knew about power. They wielded power. And at that time in history, they were the most powerful nation on earth. They worshiped power. So they understood what power was. If you'd ask any of them who has the power, they would have answered the emperor, Nero Caesar, backed up by our armies. So Paul used the term power in verse 4 probably because he knew that these people would understand that term. Of course, the one who actually had the power was God. And he had used this great power to raise his son from the dead. So Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Now, even though, as I said, the resurrection did not make him the Son, it was still very important. Why was the resurrection important? The importance of the resurrection cannot be overemphasized. If Christ's body had remained in the tomb, a question would, would remain as to whether or not his sacrifice for sin had even been acceptable to God. The fact that God raised him to life declares that his sacrifice was accepted, that God's holy wrath against sin had been appeased. About that wrath, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1, verse 18, 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. But Jesus' sacrifice appeased God's wrath. Jesus' resurrection was unique. Others had been re resurrected before, but only Jesus was raised never to die again. This one-of-a-kind resurrection was God's stamp of approval on all that Jesus was and, that, uh, and everything that he did. Notice verses 3 and 4. They are climaxed by the designation of Paul at the end of verse 4, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, these words are significant too because they tie in with those same words at the beginning of verse 3. Putting the two together, uh, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, the expression, Jesus Christ our Lord, is the fullest expression of everything Jesus is. And each part of that expression is loaded with significance. The name Jesus declares him to be the source of our salvation, our Savior. Christ is the Greek form of the word Messiah, the anointed one, the king, the one for whom the Jews had waited for centuries to come. And Lord means master or ruler. Now, this threefold comprehensive title combined the term most significant to the Jews, that is, Messiah with the word most meaningful to the Gentiles, Lord. So we can see that throughout this letter, uh, we will see that Paul's efforts are to appeal to both Jews and Gentiles. Discussing Jesus brought Paul full circle, back to himself. Verse 5 says, Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Grace. This was one of Paul's favorite topics. And he used it in a variety of ways, but always with the thought that it was a gift of God to undeserving people. One of the best definitions of grace I've run across is this. Grace is what we need but don't deserve. Now, when Paul said that he had received grace through Jesus, he may have had in mind his salvation, but just as likely he was making reference to the wondrous fact that Jesus had selected him as the apostle to the Gentiles, even though he was so undeserving. As far as Paul was concerned, every Christian talent and every task was God-given and was an expression of God's grace. Now that's the attitude all of us should have. When we're given an opportunity to serve in any way. Although we are all weak and sinful creatures and undeserving, God allows us by his grace to be instruments in his hand in preaching, teaching, or whatever else we do. And we should always be thankful for those opportunities that he gives us through his grace. Now Paul had received this grace and apostleship year uh, earlier in Damascus. 
Uh, Acts 26, verse 12 through 18 tells us that Jesus had appeared to them on the road to Damascus, qualifying him to be an apostle. Then the Lord sent a preacher named Ananias to baptize him and to deliver this divine commission. Acts 9 verse 15 tells us that the Lord had said about Paul, he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel. Now, as the apostle, to the, uh, to the Gentiles. What was Paul to do? He, in verse 5, in continuing his introduction to the Roman Christians, described his task to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Now, this is the first mention of faith in this letter to the Roman Christians. But he emphasized that we are saved on the basis of faith. So I want to look at this word faith as used by Paul. As we study this discussion, we want to keep in mind that Paul did not mean a dead, sterile faith, but a faith that is alive and active. The word translated obedience in this verse combines the word for hear with the preposition under. It carries the idea of submission to God's commands. Let's look at how several translations uh, render the phrase obedience of faith. The obedience that comes from faith. Obedience to the faith. Faith and obedience. Believe and obey. And faithful obedience. One commentator puts it this way. Faith, if it's genuine, always has obedience as its outcome. Obedience, if it's to please a God, must always be accompanied by faith. Another commentator said, it's important to note that for Paul, faith was considerably more than an intellectual agreement or even an attitude of trust. Faith in his preaching consisted of a lifestyle of obedience. So wherever he went, he presented truth to which the people uh, should agree, promises that they could trust, and commands that they should obey. So in Paul's mind, true faith and genuine obedience were inseparable. On occasion, he even used this, these two terms interchangeably Listen to what he wrote in uh, Romans 10 at verse 16. In using these, these two uh, words. In Romans 10, 16, he says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Think of saving faith and God-approved obedience as two sides of the same coin. We might discuss them separately, but they really cannot be separated. As Paul closed his personal introduction, he moved from Gentiles in general to the Gentiles in Rome. He said in uh, verse 6, among whom you, the Gentiles, also are the called of Jesus Christ. 
Um, this Greek word implies those who are divinely called. Now, are we divinely called today? Of course, but we are not called by a heavenly vision as Paul was. We are called through the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. We are not called to be apostles as Paul was, but we are called to belong to Jesus Christ. We are called to be his servants, to bring glory and honor to him. Paul was then ready to address those to whom he was writing. He could have just said to the church or congregations of the church in Rome or to the Christians in Rome. Instead, Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, added some meaningful truths about the, those to whom he was writing. He addressed his remarks to all who are beloved in Rome, called as saints. I want to take a look at those two terms that he used to refer to those who were recipients of this letter. First, he said that Christians are beloved of God. Of course, God loves everyone, but he has a unique love for those who have said yes to his call. John tells us in 1 John 3, verse 1, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. Now, we may at times feel, not feel very loved. We all go through periods in which we not only don't feel loved, we don't feel that anybody really appreciates anything we do. This is especially true concerning things we do in the context of church work. Anyone who has, hasn't taught a Bible class, for example, cannot really appreciate how hard a teacher works to get prepared for that class and its presentation. No, we may not feel loved or appreciated, but if you're, if you're a Christian, know that the Lord does love you. And you have been set inside the intimate circle of God's love. Further, Paul says that Christians are saints. Now that word saint has been abused and misused. In the Catholic religion, for example, it's used primarily to identify just a select few who were elevated to sainthood after their deaths. In the world in general, the word saint is taken to mean a perfect person or at least someone who is near perfect. And that's why we hear expressions like, wow, she's a saint, or no, he's no saint. But the Bible teaches that every Christian is a saint. For instance, saint is used interchangeably with all who have believed in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 10. The Greek word translated saint is from the same root word as the adjective meaning holy. Both of these words indicate that has, which has been set apart. When we obey the gospel, when we are saved, we are set apart by God. We are then challenged to live a sanctified or set apart lifestyle as a saint. Others refer to the Bible writers as things like Saint Matthew, Saint Mark, and so on. But if you're a Christian, 
you are a saint, no matter what your name is. We see in this auditorium today many saints. Now, I don't mean that you need to uh, as you go uh, around calling yourself saint as a title or encourage elders to do so. I'm simply emphasizing that if you are a Christian, you are special to God. And the Holy Spirit inspired Paul in this book to refer to you as beloved of God and as a saint. Paul concluded the long, long sentence of verses 1 through 7 with the greeting, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word grace was a standard greeting among the Greeks, while peace, a Greek rendering of the Hebrew word shalom, was the usual Jewish greeting. And so we have an, still another hint that Paul's message was designed to appeal to both Gentiles and Jews. The grace and peace he wished for these two groups of people comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The ultimate source of grace is God. And the only lasting peace is to be found in Jesus Christ. We wrap all this up, this statement. As a rule, correspondence in New Testament times began with the name of the person writing the correspondence. The designated recipient and some kind of greeting. As we've seen, Paul's letter to the Romans begins with all three of these elements. Another item found near the first of these letters was thanksgiving. Paul also expressed his thanks for the Christians in Rome. And our next study will begin there with verse 8. Now, in carefully unpacking the first seven verses of Romans 1, I hope we don't lose sight of the overall meaning of this passage. I especially hope that we never have the impression that the letter to the Romans is some kind of ancient text, dusty with age, written by someone who lived centuries ago to people who have long been dead. No, this letter to the Romans should be viewed as a living document as relevant today as it was the day it was written. Paul addressed this letter to those in Rome called as saints. But we can also think of this letter being directed to all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. One author suggested that the letter could be titled Paul's Letter to the Romans plus others. One commentator has well said, none of the Bible was written to us, but all of it was written for us. Does anyone have a comment or a question over what we have said? Well, that's all I have for you at the present time. <laughs> Is there no other, no other comments or questions?
appreciate very much your attention this morning.